Hello everybody. We continue the sessions on English Romantic Poetry. Today's session is devoted to Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the other big romantic of the first generation, 1772 to 1834, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Some of the poems which will be part of the discussion include Dejection and Ode, Kubla Khan, The Aeolian Harp. Coleridge was deeply influenced by psychology, philosophy and much of his work is informed by his reading in this area in these areas and you will see the influence of it in even uh, his prose work like Biographia Literaria. In Coleridge and this is where it differs from, he differs from Wordsworth, emotion, imagination are merged with philosophical meditations and he wants to build a theory of emotion and imagination and much of what we have heard uh, in previous sessions on primary and secondary imagination, fancy and imagination comes from this kind of influence from philosophy and psychology. Um, Coleridge explored the blurring of conscious and unconscious states, mixed reason and passion, and even faith at some point, if you'll recall poems like The Ancient Mariner. Um, he adopted the language of the senses very effectively, as Kerry McSweeney's book notes. Coleridge, unlike Wordsworth, is interested in the psychology of emotions. He has both feeling and thought, as David Wallens has explained it, emotions, intuitions, sensations, and also intellectual or imaginative creativity. Coleridge wished to unify sentiment, the intuitive and feeling with the rational. In the notebooks, the famous Samuel Taylor Coleridge notebooks, he would write, of every sense, each thought and each sensation lived in my eye, transfigured, not suppressed. The key word there is transfigured, it's modified. Some of you may recall what he has said, it's the mixing and merging of imagination, sentiment and nature and passion that constitutes imagination. It's not simply imitating, it's the ability to modify it, to make it your own. Our first theme in our study Coleridge is art, feeling and imagination. In Kubla Khan, one of Coleridge's most famous poems, Xanadu could be a fortress to prevent invasions from the outside or perhaps a prison inside. The dome is a dream vision. Here is your poems first sections, starting with the famous in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. And there is a description of the walls, the garden um, and later he moves it into a description of a savage place which is described as holy and enchanted and the description of the river which is thrashing and panting and there is this description of uh, the entire sequence with very strong verbs, uh, the mountain of the fountain momentarily forced and bursts and, and things like that. After that, there is a parallel vision that emerges in the poet's mind and that is our focus coming up on your slide now. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw, it was an Abyssinian maid and on a dulcimer she played singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight to win me that with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of eyes. Whether the vision of the Abyssinian maid emerges from the tumult or stanza too, with the violent imagery like I just said of water thrashing about, th rolling down the mountain, the noise, that is a moot point. This stanza is more pleasant in a dream state and the sensual effects of this newly created paradise are far more oral than visual. The sounds that emanate from the dulcimer are softer and different from the sounds of the water flowing down the mountain and the caverns uh, under the garden as Coleridge has famously described. Critics have argued that the poem is divided between the pagan half and the Christian half, resembling Coleridge's own intellectual and philosophical ambivalence. The woman wailing for her demon lover, for the erotic position of the lover by an unknown primal other and who personifies the demonic aspect of Coleridge's imagination. This woman is in sharp contrast to the idealized figure of the Abyssinian maid. So we have two women there, the woman who is wailing for her demon lover and the Abyssinian maid with the dulcimer. Coleridge modifies the ability of art to recreate the world. He introduces the conditional could. Please go back to your slide. Could I revive within me her symphony and her song? That is, he is not saying I will, he is saying could I? There is a conditional, could I revive within me all of that and let us see that again. Could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight to win me that with music loud and long I would build a dome in air. If I can revive the song, I can build a dome. 
if I can recall the memory of the song, I can build a dome. What he's saying is, it's art, the song is art. And in my mind, meaning imagination, art and imagination revive the world. That is, in these lines from starting with, could I revive within me, to I would build a dome in air. What I'm proposing is, it's art and imagination can, that can revive the world, not the dictat, not the rule uh, or order from the Emperor Kubla Khan. Art and imagination revive the world, but this depends, such as Coleridge, on memory. The languages of the senses and sentiment are clearly central to Coleridge as well, and that's our next theme. The Aeolian harp dedicated to Sarah Coleridge opens with the following, and here it is on your slide now. My pensive Sarah, thy soft cheek reclined does on my arm. Most soothing sweet it is to sit beside our cot, our cot overgrown with white flowered jasmine. And he goes on talking about the effect of nature and things like that. Notice what he's doing. In the first section uh, of the poem, my pensive Sarah, he's talking about the move focus on the visual and then moves to the oral. From limited views and perceptions to expanding ones. By the time it end, this section ends, he has moved on to something much vaster. Of yonder hill I stretch my limbs at noon, he says. The sunbeam, sunbeams dance. And he's already referred to the distant sea, which tells of silence. Coleridge moves from visual to oral, from limited views and perceptions to expanding ones. The speaker becomes aware of silence through the one exception to it, the murmur, the stilly murmur of the distant sea, he puts it. So stillness. Silence and soft oral interruptions continue throughout the poem. But what is important is the expansion of consciousness here. Initially the world is hushed, later it becomes a world so filled. Something animates the consciousness. What is that? The perceptual, the perceptual expansion from a narrow vision to a field of vision, from a limited hearing to something else, from the immediacy of the cottage to the distant sea. The perceptual expansion leads Coleridge speaker to ask this, coming up on your slide. What if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed, that tremble into thought as over them sweeps plastic and vast one intellectual breeze, at once the soul of each and God of all? The poem, one can argue, expands and contracts from Sarah and the cottage to the cosmos and back again. There's a desire to seek something more universal. Coleridge speaker wants to speak about universal but keeps returning to Sarah. The Aeolian harp in Coleridge is an image for the human mind. It is a receptive instrument molded, moved, affected by external forces, primarily nature. However, in his later work, Coleridge was not very really happy about it because he began to believe that in the Aeolian harp image, the mind is rather passive. Um, the mind waits for something to affect it, to move it. He wanted something more active, the mind as active and dynamic. Uh, but in this particular poem, of course, the poem is about the expression of sense perception, of becoming at one with the world. But Coleridge was also troubled by something else. What happens when our sense perceptions diminish? In Dejection and Ode, another famous Coleridge poem, this will be the central question. What happens when the sense perceptions, when imagination is lost? Coming up on your slide, excerpts from Dejection and Ode. He says, I've been all evening watching the western sky. But, what does he say at the end of that? And still I gaze, and with how blank an eye. It's now blank. I, I see, but I don't perceive. He's making a distinction. And then he says, I see them all so excellently fair. I see, not feel, how beautiful they are. I see, not feel, how beautiful they are. And then he says, my genial spirits fail. Imagination has failed. Having discovered that the perceptions are failing, he comes to this conclusion. I may not hope from outward forms to win the passion and the life whose fountains are within. Remember what I've just said. Coleridge proposed in the Aeolian harp that the mind is like a harp and the external stimuli that fall on the mind cause the mind to ignite, to, to become active. But he was unhappy with it because it assumed that 
the mind is just one block of something like a stone or a couch potato or something. Uh, or as my colleague would say, you just sit like potatoes there, you know, um, as in no responses to anything. Coleridge thought that was a little uh, uncharitable towards the mind. He wanted to represent the mind as something more active, something more dynamic. In this particular poem, he says, yes, I am seeing, but I'm not feeling. The failure of the imagination, he then says, is not because of nature. It's not that nature has failed. My imagination has failed. My mind has failed. I'm not perceiving things. And then he says, I may not hope from outer, outward forms to win the passion and the life whose fountains are within. We need to find ourselves, our imagination within. It has to be inside us. So even though there are visible forms present, even though there is beauty present, even though there are, uh, there, there, there are great and grand sights, there's no emotion, no heart connected with the appearance of nature. That is, the visible language in nature has no communicative force, no passion, no life. Here, Coleridge ring links perception with both sensorial and reflective abilities, to see and to feel. Despondent at the loss of imagination, he wonders, what happens when these fail? What happens when I'm unable to connect to nature? And that's why his conclusion. It's the absence of feeling, which is also the absence of thought. Unlike Wordsworth, there is no transcendence of the setting. He requires external stimulus, yes, but is unable to obtain them. He's, it's not that he's not in the lap of nature. It is because his own imagination has failed. When he claims the fountains are within, Coleridge has acquired an answer as to whether he should transcend himself or anything. If feeling and perception have failed, then the only option is reflection, to think. Creativity may yet come through philosophical reflection. Scholars have claimed that the creative power of the mind depends on a deep underlying state which Coleridge calls joy. Dorothy Emmett's comment cited in Valen's work on Coleridge. Turning into oneself is a key moment, for it returns to the power of the mind to be able to reflect. So it's not just sensuous, passionate, sentimental responses. It is reflection. In other words, Coleridge is returning not only to pure imagination, but to intellectual activity. In a state where the outward organic perceptions simply do not provide access to the vital forces, the mind may construct a sense of reality. The well-known critic Paul Magnuson writes, Coleridge turned from the figure of the passive poet as nature's instrument to one of the active imaginative being is not merely a matter of dejection. It is a shift from materialism to a philosophy in which mind constructs the world. Coleridge, as critics note, vacillates between various readings of nature and inspiration. And you have a quote here from David Ward, where he says, on the one hand, nature is the generous parent responding to the child. But there is also a sense that we need to acquire skills of reflection. Now, you will notice in what we have said so far about Coleridge, Coleridge is not giving primacy to imagination as the be all and end all of the poetic mind. He is insisting on intellectual activity. So where he first, where he began by speaking about everything outside inspiring, later he would argue in Kublai Khan, the dulcimer, the music from the dulcimer which inspires him, that recalling art, imagination are the key factors in our recreation of the world. That is, the world is partially the product of Nature is partially the product of an active mind. We receive from nature, but we also have to give to nature. In um, Dejection and Old College, you'd famously write, oh lady, we receive but what we give. As in, you can only receive from nature what we give. This is College's major contribution. The shift from a passive acquisition of things by the mind to transforming the mind into a cauldron of imaginative thinking. Reflection is central, therefore, to Coleridge's idea of poetry itself. Thank you.